Dear friends, the start of God's mission was love and the end not of Jesus' mission on earth too is love. Faith will cease, so will hope, but love will live on even in the kingdom of God to come. Welcome to you, dear friends, and thank you for joining me again for another session of Through the Bible. Our previous study began with the promise by Jesus of another Comforter, the Holy Spirit, who shall indwell the disciples. Jesus also promises that as He is in the Father and the Father is in Him, we too will share this relationship with Him. And Jesus mentions again that those who claim to love Him will keep His commandments. His desire to fellowship with His own was too strong that He will not leave them orphaned or devastated with His living. The Holy Spirit was to fill in this gap, teaching and bringing all things that had been taught by Jesus into remembrance. Finally, we looked at Jesus' teaching on He being the genuine vine and we being the branches. We see that to abide in Him means to produce effectual prayer, perpetual fruit, and have celestial joy. We are in John chapter 15, dear friend, and we finished till uh, verse 11. Now we are here in this section where we are going to talk a little bit about the sin unto death. Sometimes this removing from the place of fruit bearing is by death. Physical death, that is. I believe this is what John means in 1 John chapter 5, verse 16, when he says that there is a sin unto death. Now, a believer can go on sinning until God will remove him from the place of fruit bearing. And how is that? By death. Remember Ananias and Sapphira? They were removed by death from the early church, which was a holy fruit bearing church. These two liars could not stay in that church. Now, I'm afraid they would be pretty much comfortable in some of our fellowships today. But God would not permit them to remain in that early church. Every branch that beareth fruit, he purged it, that it may bring forth fruit. The Greek word is kathairo, which means to cleanse. Now, some people consider the purging to be pruning, and he does that too, but it really means to cleanse. There is no doubt that the Lord does some pruning. He moves into our lives and takes out those things that offend and sometimes it hurts. He removes things that are hindering us. I can speak to that subject and confess that it hurts. He prunes out that which hinders our fruit bearing. One of the reasons so many God's children get hurt by this method of pruning is that they get so far away from God and so far out of fellowship with Him. The closer we are to God, the less it will hurt. It says, Whom the Lord loveth, He chasteneth. His chastening is not a sign that He is against us. He is trying to get fruit out of our lives. We tend to complain and move away from Him, but if we draw close to Him, it won't hurt nearly so much. However, the purging in this verse literally means cleansing. We didn't cover verses 3 to 5 earlier on. Let's just go over this and uh, meditate on these few verses. Now in verse 3 of John 15 it says, Now ye are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Ye are clean through the word. The purging is accomplished by the word of God. The cleansing power of the word of God is a wonderful thing. 1 Peter 1 verses 22 to 23 says, Seeing ye have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit unto unfeigned love of the brethren, see that ye love one another with a pure heart, fervently, being born again not of corruptible seed but of incorruptible by the word of God which liveth and abideth forever. We are born again by the word of God, washed from our sins. Then in our walk down here, of course we do get dirty, but then we need the word of God 
the Word of God to wash us from our sins. That is one reason to study the Bible, to be cleansed. In Psalm 119 verse 9 it says, Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed thereto according to thy word. There are light views among you know, many people today that you can live any kind of life so long as you are fundamental in your belief of salvation by the grace of God. Think about that. Does that make sense? Believe me, God uses the word of God to reveal to us when we are not walking according to his will. The real test which reveals whether a person is genuine in his relationship to God is whether he is actively engaged in the study of the word of God, whether he is letting it have its way in his life. God intends for each one of us to be obedient to his word. Before I was afflicted, I went astray, but now have I kept thy word. Psalm 119 verse 67. It is, it is good for me that I have been afflicted, that I might learn thy statutes. Psalm 119 verse 71. My friend, he uses affliction to bring us to the word of God that you and I might be made serviceable to him. I don't think that you will ever be clean before God if you don't study the word of God. I believe that the people who are really dangerous are the ones who are as active as termites in our fellowships, but who are reluctant to study the word of God. Well, dear friend, are you a termite actively involved in different committees, different groups in the church, but then seldom do you find any time to study the word of God? That can be the most dangerous. I hope you'd pay attention to it. I consider them the most dangerous element against the Word of God and the cause of Christ in this world. We need to study the Word of God and apply it into our lives. In verse 4 it says, Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine. No more can ye except ye abide in me. We have come to the third word and I'd like you to mark this word which is abide. To abide in Christ means constant communion with him all the time. We have just talked of the cleansing power of the word of God. That is a part of abiding. We must be cleansed daily. Now, there is a story about Spurgeon, the prince of preachers, who stopped in the middle of the street, removed his hat and prayed. <laughs> One of his deacons saw this and asked him about it. Mr. Spurgeon said that a cloud had come between him and his Lord and he wanted to remove it immediately. He had stopped to confess his sinful thought. Dear friend, we need to confess our sins to the Lord to abide in him, to stay in constant communion with him. Also to abide in him, we are to keep his commandments. Now let's read verses 10. And then verse 14. If ye keep my commandments, ye shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandments, and abide in his love. Ye are my friends, if ye do whatsoever I command you. Now there's an old hymn which goes, Jesus is a friend of mine. That's what the first line says. And then there's another friend. There's not a friend like a lowly Jesus, like the lowly Jesus. Friend, let me say this kindly. There is no lowly Jesus today, but a glorified Christ at God's right hand. Calling Jesus a friend of mine is sentimental and really wrong. If I would say that the president or the prime minister is my friend, you know, I bring him down to my level, isn't it? But if he says that I am, now if the president or the prime minister says that I am his friend, now isn't that more better? Listen to what Jesus says. He says, ye are my friends, if ye do whatsoever I command you. What is he trying to say? You are raised to my level. You are along with me, a co-worker. 
Now we try to bring him down to our level. Yes, we call him our friends. Yes, we do understand that. But then sometimes we lose sight of the fact that it's not we who called him friend first. It's he who called us his friends. Sometimes we get so sentimental. But then, dear friend, we need to be in awe of the privilege that God has given to each one of us. He has called us his friends. Not so much the other way around. He has called us his friends and we need to be thankful. Question. Are we doing what Jesus has commanded us to do? Obedience, my friend, is essential to abiding. Now let's move on. Verse 9, it says, As the Father hath loved me, so have I loved you. Continue ye in my love. Abiding is a continuing communion. Now you don't have to go to a tree and then tell the branches that it should abide in the tree. No, neither should you go out and inspect the trees to figure out whether it is actually abiding, the branches abiding in that tree. What happens? The branches abide and then it does bear fruit. <laughs> it sounds ridiculous, but dear friend, Many people think that they can live like the devil all week and then suddenly on a Sunday morning head out to church, head out for worship. My friend, there's no substitute for constant communion with God. That's the only key for us to bear fruit. That means when you wake in the morning, when you are at your office in the desk, when you are driving your car on the streets, or even your bike for that matter, you are abiding in constant communion. You can always keep reflecting back and forth in whatever uh, job that you're involved in or wherever you are, you can always be in touch with Him. That's what true abiding is all about. Because we have free will, we can break fellowship with God by allowing sin in our life, by stepping out of the will of God or by worldliness. Now he wants us to abide so that so that we may bring forth much fruit. You will notice here that there is a similarity to the parable of the sower. Remember that some of the seed fell on good ground and brought forth thirtyfold, that is fruit. Some of the seed brought forth sixty, that is more fruit. Then some of the seed brought forth an hundredfold, that is much fruit. Dear friend, God wants us to bear much fruit. If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch and is withered. And men gather them and cast them into the fire and they are burned. This is verse 6. Let me say again that this is talking about our fruit bearing, the product of our salvation. Now it's not talking about how we are saved. Paul uses another illustration for the same thing. For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now if any man build upon this foundation, gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. This is talking, dear friend, about the works of the believers the fruit in the life of a believer. Fire will purify gold and silver and precious stones and draw off the dross. Wood, hay and stubble will go up in smoke. That is the same as our verse which says, the works will be cast into the fire and burned. 1 Corinthians chapter 3 verses 11 to 14 says, If any man's work abide which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. I believe that rewards will be given only for the fruit in our lives and we don't produce the fruit. He produces the fruit, dear friend, when we abide in Him. A branch that is not abiding in Christ is cast forth as a branch and is withered and men gather them and cast them into the fire and they are burned. This is amplified by 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 15. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss. 
but he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. He may get to heaven smelling as if he had been bought at a fire sale, but he will not lose his salvation. One of the saddest things is that today the average Christian believes that normal Christian living is failure. They think that bearing much fruit is entirely out of the question and are willing to live on a low plane hoping to produce just a little fruit. Remember that the Lord wants us, He expects us to produce much fruit. John 15 verses 7 to 8 If ye abide in me and my words abide in you, ye shall ask what ye will and it shall be done unto you. Herein is my Father glorified that ye bear much fruit. So shall ye be my disciples. This is a marvelous prayer, I promise. But notice the condition. If ye abide in me and my words abide in you. That means to be obedient to him. Then we will have effectual prayer. The whole purpose of the abiding and of the praying is that the Father may have glory. This eliminates prayer for selfish reasons. The issue is fruit bearing. God is glorified when we do bear fruit. Verses 9 to 11 says, As the Father hath loved me, so have I loved you. Continue ye in my love. If ye keep my commandments, ye shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things have I spoken unto you, that my joy might remain in you, and that your joy might be full. The Lord wants us to have a good time. One of the fruits of the Spirit is to have joy, joy in your life. Now, I do get kind of turned off by the super pious believers who have no humor in their lives. You know, they walk around with a huge Bible in their arms. Well, dear friend, a fruit-bearing believer will have a lot of fun in his life. He will have a blast. There will be fun in going to a Bible study. There will be fun in serving the Lord. Believe me, you will have a great time. A life in fellowship with Christ is a joyous life. So dear friend, if you are a believer and you think that being a Christian means to you know go with a frown, no, I don't think so. Why don't you start putting some laughter in your life, some joy in your life? Believe that God wants you to have the abundant, joyous, good life. Enjoy it. Verse 12 says, This is my commandment that ye love one another as I have loved you. Remember, he is talking to believers in this discourse. We are to love each other as he has loved us. Now, it's sad to see so many people turn and tear each other down. There's a lot of gossip. There's a lot of friction and a lot of faction. The Spirit of God is not working in such a situation. One can have Bible teaching and still reject this commandment of our Lord. To love as He has loved us is putting it on a very high plane. Only the Spirit of God can produce such love in our lives. Greater love hath no man than this, this is verse 13, that a man lay down his life for his friends. There is the test. Ye are my friends if ye do whatsoever I command you. This is verse 14. The Christian life is not a hit and miss proposition. The Christian life is following his instructions to the T, and the instructions are very clear. If you follow these instructions, you will bear fruit, you will bear much fruit. He laid down his life for us. What does he ask us? He asks us to obey him. He is our friend because he died for us. We are his friends when we keep his commandments. He doesn't ask all of us to die for him. Someone asked D.L. Moody, whether he had dying grace. Now Mr. Moody replied that he didn't have it, but when he needed it, the Lord would give it to him, and he did. Henceforth I call you not servants. This is verse 15. For the servant knoweth not what his Lord doeth. But I have called you friends. For all things that I have heard of my Father I have made known unto you. Ye have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you that ye should go and bring forth fruit and that your fruit should remain, 
that whatsoever ye shall ask of the Father in my name, he may give it to you. This is verse 15 and 16. We are the friends of Christ if we do whatsoever he has commanded us. Now he tells us that he has opened up his heart to us. God wants to reveal himself to us. Remember how he searched out Abraham to reveal his plan to him because Abraham was his friend. Now Christ tells us that he has revealed the things of God to us. That is what a friend does. How many people can you go to and open up your heart? Can you? Not many. One of the things that should characterize a believer is that you should go to him and tell him everything. Tell him all your problems and get understanding and help and encouragement from him. This is how we are to love one another, dear friend. Now notice, it says, Ye have not chosen me, but I have chosen you. A great many people do not like the doctrine of election, but it is wonderful and practical. Many a discouraged believer has cast himself on the Lord saying, Lord, you called me, you chose me, I am your child. G. Campbell Morgan said, He chose me, therefore I am his responsibility. <laughs> That's wonderful. That's trust, dear friend. This little crowd of disciples is going to scatter in a few hours, remember? And the shepherd will be crucified and the sheep will scatter. At such an hour, Jesus tells them, Ye have not chosen me, but I have chosen you. A preacher who had made a transformation late in life had been guilty of stealing before he was saved. After he had just started preaching about his Savior and was still a new believer, he passed a hen house on his way home from church one night. And it was a great temptation for him. But he stopped and prayed. Lord, your property is in danger, and I don't mean the chickens. <laughs> now, it is wonderful to call upon the Lord like that, isn't it? His great purpose is that we should produce fruit. Not just passing fruit, but fruit that will remain. It must all be in His will. If we abide in Him, then we can ask in His name. Answers to our prayers are a pretty good barometer of our spirituality. He climaxes this section on fruit bearing by mentioning again that we should love one another. These things I command you that ye love one another. Then he goes on to say, If the world hate you, ye know that it hated me before it hated you. If ye were of the world, the world would love his own. But because ye are not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hateth you. Well, dear friend, our time is up. We've got to close this study, but I hope this excites you. The fact that he doesn't want to call you a servant, but he recognizes you as a friend, which means he really desires to, you know, get his plan across to you. Dear friends, we have heard military mights conquer kingdoms and nations by force and fear. The love of God conquer our hearts and will never let us go. Hate and bitterness have really no place in God's world. The Son of God came that we may learn love as greater than force, whether on earth or in heaven. Love opens the heart of God the Father, and love took our friend, the Son of God, to the cross. Today, love has taken many children of God to nations far and wide, so that God's free gift of eternal life through His Son reaches to all. Dear friends, it is time we bear fruits, fruits that brings hope and fruits that last eternally. God bless you. Music